You're listening to the Faith and Other Oddities podcast, brought to you by the Raven Creek Social Club, where we talk about faith and other oddities. For questions, comments, or to be part of the conversation, join us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, where you can find us at Raven Creek SC. Now for your hosts, Emily Dixon and Nathan Underwood. So now we're done talking about all the excitement of the commentarians bonus episode, you know, our, our birthdays and stuff. There's uh, something else that happened in your life that I Another think you should birthday. tell. Another birthday. Yeah, you should tell people about that. Yeah, I'm actually a grandma. I know it's hard to believe I'm way too young. It shouldn't happen. But yeah, I, my oldest daughter had her first baby and mm-hmm. I got to be there for the labor and delivery and got to be one of the first people to hold her and. Uh, yeah, I, I'm actually, I'm thinking I'm going to rock this grandma gig better than I ever did the mom thing. I just, <laughs> this is my reward for surviving the mom <laughs> thing. <laughs> well, you get to send them back when you're grandma. Oh, the most beautiful moment so far. I was holding this little one and I hear that wonderful sound that lets me know the diaper is being loaded. Mm-hmm. And I just look at my daughter and I said, Lauren, your daughter needs you. <laughs> it, it was f- fabulous. And so, uh, you know, it, it's, it's been great. Um, I actually got to see a lot more of them than I anticipated getting to see them, uh, just due to various circumstances and, uh, got to testify in a trial that Lauren also had to testify. That's a whole long story. But, uh, that meant that Lauren got to stay at my house for a little while because she lives two and a half hours away. And, yeah. and, you know, this, okay, this is how amazing my grandbaby is. And, you know, everyone's got these stories and I'm starting right off the bat at 12 days old. I had her looking out the window and she was watching, like tracking the birds flying around and she was smiling at them. And then when the cardinal would show up in the bright red, she'd do this little oh face, you know, it wouldn't make the sound, Mm -hmm. just the oh face. And you could tell she was so happy and excited to see him. And if I would move her away from the window. She'd, uh, 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 and then I would have to like put her back at the window and she'd start smiling again. And I'm like, okay, Lauren's in for a world of hurt. She is going to pay for her raising. Has has (laughs) she, now has she figured out, uh, does she have like a hungry cry and a sleepy cry? Yeah. Ma, ma, ma is the, the, the hungry. And then she, she's not so much a sleepy cry as I'm mad at the world screams. Oh, okay. Yeah. So just like her mama. Yeah. Oh, and- yeah. Yeah. Your your <laughs> oldest. Yeah. She definitely. When she was when she was upset and sleepy, there it was. It was screaming until she fell asleep. Yeah. It, it, there was no crying about it, and she could do that for four hours. Yeah. And it, it was just. I, I told her over and over again. If I realized that babies were not supposed to be that hard, I, I would have just chunked her or something. I mean, I would have put her up for adoption because she was like the most trying child. And then my second one comes along, and she's like. The little cuddly little squish ball that you expect newborns to be. And, you know, they traded places as teenagers and mm-hmm. the younger one became the hard one to deal with. But, um, you know, so far I'm like, I'm only getting to deal with the new grandbaby when I want to or, you know, not as much as I want to, but I get to send her back and I've yeah. already got plans. I'm going to warp this child's mind. Don't, I'm, yeah. Not too much. Oh, well, you know, we have to a little bit. That that's just mandatory, and I get to do it because I can send her home, and then Lauren has to deprogram her. Yeah, and so <laughs> be sure to put lots of sugar in her before you send her back to. Oh, her. absolutely. So the um, yeah, when when our youngest was born, talking about the cries, we had very easy like from the time she came out, if she was hungry, she'd go ah ah ah, and if she was sleepy, she'd go ooh ooh ooh, and then she you'd kind of rock her a little bit, and she'd go right out. Well, your child, she was just a weird baby. She, I, she was kind of a weird baby. From the time she was able to walk, she would, when she was sleepy, she'd grab her, her pacifier and her blanket and go knock on her door because <laughs> yep. she was ready for a nap. And you just open the door and let her in and yeah. pretty much, you know, yeah. helped her into bed if she needed it. But yeah, you, yeah, you set her in the crib and she was out. So yeah. So, but yeah, I'm kind of hoping that it's going to be, you know, that this one's going to be similar in some of those respects. And, you know, and Lauren, Everybody was kind of like, well, how do you think she's going to be? And do you think she's going to be able to handle, you know, be a good mom? Because Lauren's not real girly girl. She never has been. She, you know, breaks horses and works on cars and things like that. And she's like so chill about this. 
it, it's it's funny. It, it's cracking me up because it's like I'm a mom. I have a baby. I take care of the baby. And yeah. there, a lot of that angst that you see with new moms is just not there. So I, I'm kind of it's kind of fun for me to see her have such. I mean, she's just she's making it work. And she went through the whole labor and delivery. No pain meds. She, I mean, yeah. she just rocked and, it out. And if you want more details on that, you can record that on your own and, <laughs> and just post that up. In well, Patreon now I or have to, you know, that for women today to to do that uh, when they know there's other options, but to still make that decision and just let their body do their thing, I think that's just that's awesome. Yep. And so uh, your wife too. I mean, yeah, yeah, she we yeah no drugs, just got to be there for those two uh, getting here. So this was actually birth number five. That I got to attend if I count my two kids. Cool. Six if I count my own. But I don't remember that. So. Yeah, that's fair. <laughs> Probably for the best. So. Yeah. Moving on. <laughs> so, so we have got a humdinger of a show today. Oh my goodness. And uh, I'm going to put out, uh, this is where we get to put out our disclaimer. Uh, we are going to be dealing with some adult content. Um, a lot of adult content. A lot of adult content. That's basically the, the, the full of the show. And. Um, and I also want to say for anyone who's been following along, we, you know, this is probably a little late to put this out there. <laughs> we are not just going through the Bible trying to tell stories about sex. We're just go- <laughs> <laughs> like, because it seems like there was a few episodes in a row where that seemed like that was about all we were talking about. We're not, lo- we're not going out of our way to find this stuff. We're just going through the text and Yeah, and if you're following along, you realize that. We're just going from one passage to the next passage. Yeah, and and when we when we chose to go through and and kind of look at stories in Genesis, I didn't realize like exactly <laughs> how much sex is in the Bible until well, I mean, I knew there was a lot, but I didn't realize how much was just in Genesis alone mm-hmm. until we started going through this and I'm like I'm talking about this stuff on mic going what am I doing with my life right now? <laughs> and so, um, so yeah, it, we're not going out of our way to find it. We're not trying to do this for the sake of shock or controversy. But I don't think we should avoid it but, either. But yeah, I don't think we need to back down from it. And I think the Bible has a lot of the stuff in there for the reason, for a reason. And, and those reasons are things we're trying to find. So, mm-hmm. uh, so we're not doing this just to tantalize or, or, or be controversial or, or sensational, sensational, none of that. Anyone who knows me, I, I hate controversy for controversy's sake. I think it's ridiculous and childish. But man, is there a lot of sex in the Bible? And because it's in the it's in the text, we're going to talk about it. So, mm-hmm. uh, but today we wanted to put a disclaimer out there because this one is very uh, and it's we should it's very rough. Yeah, and you know, not to be politically correct, uh, but trigger warning: um, we are dealing with a rape, and um, that's. Um, it's a major story in the Bible. Um, there's actually a lot of other stories in the Bible that pull from its themes. And so it's important that we get the story and we, we actually read it. Because I, you know, I don't think I've ever heard this one taught from the pulpit. I've, I've never heard it taught from the pulpit and, or in Sunday school or in mm-hmm. small group. Uh, and I know I've read through the Bible before and I kind of remembered it once I read through it again. But... Uh, when uh, when I was talking to uh, Mickey about what was coming up, I mentioned the story and she was like, I don't even know what story you're talking about. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, it it's not a popular one. And, and there's I'm sure there's reasons. Well, um, I think that's one of the funny things about um, about the way Christians study the Bible. We do tend to study it in little broken down bits and pieces, um, especially if we're talking to kids. Uh, we discuss. Uh, you know, things that make good flannel graphs and good veggie tail videos mm-hmm. and, and things like that, which is, is probably appropriate. But you, when you contrast that to the Jewish way of doing uh, Bible study, you would begin to teach the children Torah when they be, could begin to speak. Right. So, you know, no later than three. And because they were considered young and had just you know, been sent here from God, from the, a holy God, they would start them with the holiest book, which they considered to be Leviticus. Mm-hmm. And if you think about what's in Leviticus, I, I just pause right now, go read Leviticus 18, and imagine trying to teach your child to memorize that when at the we, age of three. Yeah, we are three years old. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, they, they didn't shy away from, from teaching this to the, their children. I think 
Uh, and even some of that, I think it goes back to having that very agrarian society where all of this came out of, where sex and a sexual event, that was just normal. You you couldn't hide from the fact that, you know, there's 200 sheep at your front door. What are they doing in the spring? It, it's kind of funny because we can, it's kind of backward now because sex used to be a very public kind of act with a lot of mystery involved in it. Right. But now we have, it's a very, now it's a very private, mysterious act with not much mystery with a little with less mystery scientifically it's kind of flipped its role there yeah we well we we've glamorized it while stripping it of meaning oh that's fair and so when we do talk about it most of the time it's not a substantive discussion Mm. and uh so i you know i can't i'm sorry i just can't go with you know cosmos 37 positions to drive him wild that's not helping you understand how sex shapes and influences you as a person and how to honor yourself as a sexual being. Um, Now, I'm not saying don't have fun with that if you're married, but at the same time, we need to realize that the discussion needs to go deeper. Sure, sure. So, And the discussion needs to be had in the right context. But so. we wanted to put that out there, and, and from here, it's going to get weird. Yeah, so. yeah. Um, for a story that is so rarely taught in Christian circles, It amazed me how much I found online. And I'm not talking like, you know, uh, Christian Middle Earth, as Heiser puts it. Um, Yeah, there was definitely some of it in there. But I'm talking even academic papers. Uh, There there is a ton of uh, speculation because this is one of the stories where we're given just enough information to have the bare bone structure. But then there's a lot of unanswered questions. Yeah. And... Um, basically Jacob and Esau have parted ways at this point mm-hmm. and Jacob goes to the city of Shechem and when he goes there, he purchases a piece of land. Now the purchasing, excuse me, the purchasing is very symbolic. This is the first time since Abraham. So we're three generations in that somebody from the covenant community is, is buying a piece of property in the land that God promised them. Mm-hmm. And the, Jacob purchasing the land is very significant beyond that because we see that his way of wanting to acquire the land and to make his place in land is by purchasing. It's not through conquest. It's not through violence. And so that sets us up with kind of how to view what's getting ready to happen. Okay. And so um, basically uh, the, the story opens up with um, Genesis 34. The first verse, it says, Now Dina, the daughter whom Leah had borne to Jacob, went out with the daughters of the land. Okay. First of all, when the Bible gives you a bit of information that seems kind of superfluous, then you need to pay attention. Right. So Dina's the daughter of Leah, or Leah. I've watched too much Star Wars. Yep. <laughs> so um, she, she goes out. And this is where immediately the controversy begins. She went out. And because the question is, is in going out, was she in violation of some kind of prohibition for for women to stay inside within the protected family um, unit that she wouldn't go out to see the daughters of the land? Now, her dad's bought property there. This is where they're they're living for the time. Mm-hmm. Um you know, kind of seems to be the normal thing, get to know your neighbors. And a young girl going to hang out with other girls, that would be normal. Right. But Rashi, and and I love Rashi, and uh, he's one of the great medieval commentators on uh, the Torah. And matter of fact, a quick note, if you go to um, Bible Hub, you can actually turn on the Rashi commentary. Interesting, I didn't know that. Yeah, there's a little click. And so uh, you can turn that on and you can actually read it and you don't have to buy the stuff and it it breaks it down verse by verse. But he connects this with uh, Leah going out to um, Jacob after um, Reuben finds the mandrakes and Rachel bargains with Leah uh, to get the mandrakes Mm. from Reuben and Leah goes out and it's a brazen act. And and she tells Jacob, she says, you're going to spend the night with me because I, I, I hired you. I bought you for the night. Yeah. And so Rashi says, this is the reason why we're seeing this connected back to Leah. 
Dina is Leah's daughter. Leah's very brazen. Dina's very brazen. brazen. And so this is her fault. So and, so it's, yeah, I was about to ask, is there is there a, a link to like victim blaming here? Mm-hmm. Is that very, very much. On? And it's also the reason why uh, in a lot of uh, the very conservative uh, Jewish communities that uh, women didn't go out. They, and we even see this later on uh, with uh, David, uh, his daughter Tamar, it says that she was one of the virgins, so she didn't go out. Mm-hmm. And so this idea that you protect women by keeping them in. Now, there's some debate on whether that's the correct reason for this to happen or that something else was going on here. You know, was it right to think that she should stay at home? And that's not just even modern commentators. This is a debate that goes way, way, way back. Yeah. Yeah. Ancient. And the other thing we should note is she goes back and uh, she goes, goes out and um, she's old enough to go out on her own. So we know that some time has passed since when she was born in Laban's house versus now. Mm-hmm. We, we don't have a clear cut timeline on when that is, but she, you know, she's evidently old enough to even for Jacob to consider to marry her, uh, to marry her off. Right. So, um, so she goes out and uh, Shechem, who's the prince, and it's really interesting that Shechem and the town Shechem have the same name. Mm-hmm. So, because remember in, in this part of the Bible, a name isn't just what you're called by. This isn't just an identifier. This it's, is, it's a descriptor. It's a descriptor. So there's this idea that the city of Shechem and the person of Shechem had the same kind of personality and essence about them. So, um, you know, this really leads some questions as far as who were the inhabitants of the city? What were they like? Particularly as we get into the story. And so she goes out and verse two, Shechem, the son of Hamar, the Hittite, the chief of the country, saw her, took her and lay with her by force being strongly drawn to Dina, daughter of Jacob, and in love with the maiden, he spoke to the maiden tenderly. Okay, one thing I want to I wanna put this mm-hmm. out, because this is one of those things where you talked about, excuse me, where you talked about uh, the way of studying is different, where uh, a lot of the, the Jewish uh, commentators will just address stuff head on, mm-hmm. and we tend to, you know, the Christian uh, tradition, we tend to, downplay and soften use, it soften it use euphemisms and in in the uh this is what you read is J, the jps uh-huh. english translation right. so what i've got here i've got the the esv and it said um uh, shechem the son of hamar the hivite uh, the prince of the land saw her seized her lay with her and humiliated her it doesn't say that he slept with her by force ah and so i that's just like I said, that's just kind of that one of those examples of right where when the we words, downplay things in translation. The words mean the same thing, but they carry a different nuance. And uh, so they do, but I, I, I think I think you could get there if you're if you're reading the euphemism. Mm-hmm. But I think it's one of those things. It's like why not just call it what it is? Well, and that's the problem because there's no Hebrew word specifically for rape. Okay, we have rape being described. We uh, Deuteronomy twenty eight um, that we referred to earlier in a previous mm-hmm. you know previous episode. Um, we have this idea of what it is, but at the same time, we don't have a specific word that says this is definitely to to take a woman can also refer to a consensual act within marriage. Right, uh, it, it's not necessarily always violent. It, it could be. And then we have the, it's really weird because he was strongly drawn to her and in love with the maiden and he spoke tenderly to her. And so we go from what we consider to be a brutal, violent act Mm -hmm. to, to this very affectionate, almost love story type language, not that it is a love story, but the type of language. And and that's the other problem. We, Dina never speaks, even though the story's about her. The story it, it it it's not really about her. It's about her, but it's not about her. She, right. She's she's not a person in this. She she's an object that is acted upon, that's traded away, 
uh, has her future decided for her, but she she herself never once gets to speak up. And so we, it, it's you, you have to wonder, and this is where a lot of the controversy comes in, was it consensual? Right. Was, was it only considered to be rape because it was not in a marriage that had been planned and arranged by the parents? Right. And, you know, now we're back to women being, you know, bargaining chips for the men, which was very much a part of that culture. Sure. And so, um, now, it says, when Jacob heard that his daughter had been defiled, the sons were in the field with his cattle. Jacob kept silent till they came home. And so we don't know if they, this is another point in, where the language, once again, it's ambiguous. Did the sons come home and then they were told? Or did the sons hear about it and they came rushing home? Right. So we, we really don't have that answer. This whole story is like a, the whole, all the language in the Hebrew is that it can be read both ways. Right. And, and I think there's some in, intent behind that. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, it's very frustrating as a, as a writer or as a reader to try to wonder what gaps do I fill in? Yeah. Yeah. Because, yeah, there's, there's not a lot there. And it, and it seems like they're trying to be sympathetic to Shechem, even though he seems to be a very aggressive character in this. Yeah. Well, and, now, the sons, when they hear, you know, Jacob's silent, and that's going to be the theme. Jacob's going to just be silent. When the, when the sons hear about it, they're angry and distressed, and the same words are used of Cain when God rejects his offering. Mm-hmm. And so there's this idea that when you're angry and distressed or angry and sad, that dangerous things are getting ready to happen. Sure. And, and I think we kind of all know that to be true in our own lives. Right. And they say that such a thing should not be done in Israel. And that phrase is important. We're going to come back to why that phrase is important. But such a thing should not be done in Israel. And when Shechem's dad, Hamor, he comes out and he, he makes this offering. He says, hey, um, my son Shechem longs for your daughter. This is verse 8. Please give her to him in marriage. Intermarry with us. Give your daughters to us and take our daughters for yourself. And you would dwell among us, and the land will be open before you. Settle, move about, and acquire holdings in it. And then Shechem said to her father and the brothers, Do me this favor, and I will pay whatever you tell me. Ask of me the bride price ever so high, as well as the gifts, and I will pay. And you tell me only what to give to have this maiden for a wife. So the fact that he's willing to pay a lot of the ancient commentators, the Jewish commentators see this as an admission of guilt. And so, you know, remember when uh, Abimelech had Sarah, now he paid as a testimony that he hadn't done anything, but that was with Abraham's wife. Mm -hmm. And, but when you're talking about a woman who had been a virgin to this point, now this is an admission of guilt. Right. So it's the, it's the change in standing. And, um, this bride price here, this is the basis, and I think this is really kind of interesting of what we know as the ketuva. Um, and a lot of people don't realize that. I don't know that word. What's, yeah. what's the ketuva? The ketuva is basically a Jewish prenup. Okay, okay. And the, the function is that um, this was a certain amount of money set aside for the bride. So if a husband divorced her for any reason other than adultery, this had to be given to her. So that she could, was not just left destitute and she could actually uh, continue on and, and make a life for herself. So it could, you know, she got so many sheep or she got so much gold. She, she got a set value. Mm-hmm. And this still happens in traditional Jewish communities today. And I actually, um, I was watching a show and a woman had, who had a ketuva, she was wanting to start a, bu- a business and her husband would not allow the, her to spend the money to go into the business as so she goes to her uncle and says, Hey, will you buy my ketuva? Mm-hmm. And basically it, it, she was using it as collateral for, for a loan and being able to, you know, and her uncle's like, well, you know, if, 
you stay married to him, then I'm not going to get it. And she's like, yeah, so, you know, you're betting against my marriage not working, which is probably not. And so, um, but this, we actually, uh, in one of the museums uh, in Tulsa, the, I should have thought of the name, looked it up before. They actually have like a whole display of these going back through the Middle Ages huh. and they're written up in calligraphy and they're beautiful and they would have been kept in a prized area of the home. And, and this really was a testament to the woman's worth and value because if a man was willing to marry a woman and being willing to face the possibility of losing this part of his estate, then she had to be worth it. Right. And, th- and it was really having, it was having it a ketuva that uh, separated a wife from a concubine. And so Shechem isn't just offering to to marry her and take her into a, the house as a concubine. He wants her as a wife. Right. So there, there is this real testimony of, yeah, I may have been guilty. And again, that, that question, is he, is he guilty of violence against Dina or is he guilty of breaking custom? Right. So the, what level of guilt? He, he's accepting the guilt, but he still wants her. And... But if you notice, it, Hamor, he comes to speak to, to Jacob, and the, the, the pronouns there, I don't know, are they singular? Uh, verse 8, is that uh, Hamor spoke to them or Hamor spoke to him? Uh, in which translation? ESV. I, I, ESV, I think it's... Uh... It's, it's them in, it, in them? ESV. Okay. Yeah. It's in both. Yeah, um... If Indivar, Hamar, uh, it is to them. Okay, yeah. I'm sorry. I was actually reading it. I, there was a commentary I was reading that was wrong. Okay, perfect. So, <laughs> yeah, uh, don't worry, you aren't reading it. But it's interesting because typically the, the bride price would have been negotiated with the father, not the brother, unless the father's dead. So why are the brothers speaking up? Because in verse... 11, Jacob's sons answered him. Mm-hmm. And um, they're mad. They're mad because he's, the, he's defiled their sister. And they said, we can't do this thing. We can't give you to him, but, uh, give you her because you're uncircumcised. Right. And then from there, Shechem, I mean, this is the thing that blows my mind. Not only does he agree to be circumcised himself, he talks everyone into the village, in the village into it. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> so this tells you he's an important guy. I don't think anybody, just Joe Blow off the uh, street could have said, hey guys, yeah, we're, we're all going to get circumcised now. And it actually says in verse 19, and he lost no time in doing the thing for he wanted Jacob's daughter. And you'll notice Jacob, again, Jacob has not spoken. Right. The brothers have laid out the terms and conditions. They have been the ones who've said, this is what we need to do. And you, you kind of, what, what's going on here that Jacob is not opening his mouth? Yeah. Well, and I mean, do you, is this kind of Jacob being a bit of a schemer thinking that maybe he'll, uh, he'll be able to profit from this marriage? I mean, because you see, you see that later on with uh, with Solomon mm-hmm. uh, in in his you know his dealings with other nations, he takes on all these wives and concubines, absolutely, in order to make treaties. And so, is that what we have here? Is Jacob thinking that, oh well, if if I have a son in law, then he, then they're going to take care of me? But then, of course, we also see that Hamar and Shechem are not exactly <laughs> <laughs> on the up and up about this. Well, and. Shechem, the city, was part of what was was promised to Jacob. Uh-huh. And so you, he could very well be scheming, oh, this is how God's going to fulfill his promise. I mean, it, and we do that today. Uh, this is, oh, this is, must be how God's going to do it. Uh, it doesn't quite seem to be on the up and up, but hey, maybe I don't have the best moral code, and it's not technically wrong. And that's, that's the problem. We don't have anyone... Shechem's the only one who's technically wrong, but he's probably the most sympathetic character in all of this. Yeah, which is weird. Which is very strange. Yeah. 
Talk about your anti-hero type of fiction. Yeah, well, because Dina never speaks and she doesn't have a voice, we don't know how to relate to her. Right. That That's completely ambiguous. I mean, was she out there, as some of the commentators do say, you know, was she playing the whore? That's, and that's what some of the comments are uh, right. very much, that this is what she was doing. And so she, this was kind of, quote unquote, and this is not me saying this, this is some of the other writings I've read, that this was kind of her just desserts. Right. And, uh, you know, I would never say that to, about any woman, but uh, they do carry through with the uh, with the circumcision, not just Shechem, uh, but the person, but Shechem, the whole town. Mm-hmm. And then let's see on the third day. I mean, this is like well planned out on the third day when the when they were in pain. Simon and Levi, two of Jacob's sons, the brothers of Dina, took each his sword, came upon the city unmolested, and slew all the males. So, <laughs> yeah, Simon and Levi, wh- why it's important, it's them. These are Dina's two full brothers. Right. Uh, they're not half-brothers. They're, they, um, they're older than her, and they wipe out an entire city. Yeah, well, you know, they're a little impaired. They're probably not feeling like moving a whole lot. Yeah, but this is where, this is also another point of debate. Uh, There's a guy, his name is Sternberg. Uh, If you look up Sternberg and Rape of Dina on, uh, just Google it. I mean, you don't have to go to any major database. Uh, He has several books and articles, and not only will you find his books and articles, you will find counter books and articles to his viewpoint because he says that the Torah totally supports but because they they won the battle um they claimed the city which was part of God's promise that the Torah is completely supporting Simon and Levy okay the problem is there's the counter argument is the fact that they use circumcision as the means to get it okay this this is the sign of the most intimate ultimate sign of the covenant between God and Abraham Mm-hmm. And to use something sec- so sacred and holy as the means to exact revenge, then there's a problem here. Does this, is, does this kind of tie into the, the rabbinic maxim of uh, don't use the Torah as a spade, spade. For, digging, for digging profit? Yeah. Does it kind of tie into that kind of y- thought? Exactly. And the, you, you as a human being don't have the right to use God's things for your own purpose and agenda. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we could talk about how the whole prosperity gospel gets that backwards. But anyway. Oh, my goodness. Uh, <laughs> well, all we have to do is go to Acts for that and look at this, this, the story of Simon the sorcerer. We, let's not do that today. <laughs> but this is a, a very interesting reversal uh, because it's, I mean, quite literally, it's Shechem's penis that gets him into this mess. And it's also what kills him. And so it's a very graphic reversal of circumstance and the fact that what he thought was for enjoyment actually winds up being his demise. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Oh, yeah. That's, I mean, the Bible's amazing. (laughs) Uh, I mean, (laughs) so it's, yeah, it's just, (laughs) wow. Yeah. Sorry that, that. I hadn't I hadn't thought of it in those terms, but basically, yeah, you're right. It's like, well, and he, he thought that was going to be the thing that was going to get him what he wanted, but that then got him killed. I mean, mm-hmm. if that's not an analogy for life and whatnot. But anyway, so the um, now one of the things I did find interesting, I was reading uh, through this text. Actually, I actually got a chance to read. You did the, homework. <laughs> I did homework actually this time. Um, it, my computer's been working, so, <laughs> but. Uh, yeah, the interface has been working the way it's supposed to, so I haven't had to like pull my hair out as we're getting ready for all this stuff. But uh, I did find it interesting. There is speculation that the that that they had actually kidnapped Dina, and that she was being held hostage. I don't know if you had anything on that, but that she was being held hostage. There was kind of a time when uh, yeah. the forced captivity would have been considered a legal marriage after a certain time, and so the boys were going to to rescue her as opposed to just going and kill everyone. Yeah. Cause verse 26 does say that Dina was 
in Shechem and Hamor's house. Okay. And so we definitely know that she was there. Um, there, There's some ancient laws that would seem to indicate that, you know, it's kind of like possession is nine-tenths of the law, and she's very much a possession. Um, yeah, in the story, that's how she's portrayed. Yeah. And not only the thing is, when they go in to rescue her, not only do they kill everyone, well, they kill all the men. They take the women and children as slaves. Um, they uh, seized the flocks, the asses, and all that was inside the town and outside, all their wealth, all the children and their wives, all that was in the houses, they took as captives and booty. So, and, it, and again, subverting what uh, Hamer, is it Hamer or Shechem, mm-hmm. which one, the one that says all of their, all of their beast and wealth will be ours after this marriage. Right. And so this is going in and taking back everything. Uh, yeah, and so, you know, is this a stand against this kind of allegiance uh, that that Hamar and Shechem thought that they were going to to acquire? Now, it is interesting, too, that this connects the, this plundering of the city without God's command and to take all these things. Uh, the, the language here, and we're not going to go into it, I just, in case anybody wants to, to study it on their own later, this connects it back to Joshua when he's going into the city of Jericho and Achan keeps some of the, the spoils that they were supposed to destroy. Okay. And so there, there's that connection. And, and the writer of Joshua actually plays with the same themes in that story. And it, it's an interesting story. And it, there's, this actually shows up. Uh, I mean, even in Esther, we see connections there with her story uh, to this. Uh, and, I was trying to pick through which stories to to talk about because we could, I mean, we could just go story after story where this is the framework. Uh, but then you actually brought up one. I'm like, oh, okay, well, I thought about that one. Nathan thought about that one. So we're going to go with that one. But we're, we aren't quite there yet. Okay. Um, Jacob, uh, when he does finally speak, he, he he's scolding Simon and Levy and he says, you brought trouble on me, making me odious among, or kind of, you made me dirty. Uh, the, it's in, uh, in the ESV, it says, you've made me stink to these people. Okay. Okay. Yeah. The, the, yeah. To among the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the, my men are few in number, so that if they unite against me and attack me, I and my house will be destroyed. So Jacob, even though there's been this great kind of transformation in him, He's he's still he still has enough forethought. He he's still consider he's considering the consequences. You know you don't just walk into someone else's house and you know shoot their dog. You know yeah. I I, I couldn't think of a better <laughs> analogy that was appropriate. So. I'd probably shoot you if you shot. Well, not the dog at my house now. That's a whole other story. Uh, <laughs> well, that's not your dog. That's your that's, husband's. That's dog. my husband's dog. And uh, yeah, no, if it'd been my dog. Um. No, I wouldn't. I would never would have shot your dog. That was the best dog ever. <laughs> ever. So, but this is the first time uh, Jacob speaks up, and it, it's to scold his son, uh, his sons, and they just. You have to wonder where was the dad voice for Dina? Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and he's not even really worried about Simon and Levy at this point. He's worried about himself. Uh, and he's also worried about his house because it, it, we, we haven't spent a lot of time on it, but Jacob's desire, his, his overwhelming kind of guiding idea is to, that he wants to establish a house. Mm. Uh, Bethel, Bethel, the house of God. He, he wants to create this place where God's people can live. And w- again, we're going back to, we mentioned it in the last episode, we need a functioning family. Right. And we still haven't had one. And Jacob, now he's seen everything he worked for, you know, tricking Esau, working for Laban, coming back, wrestling with the angel of the Lord. And it's getting ready to be gone. Mm-hmm. And so I, I guess you can say the good thing about Jacob is he's goal oriented. Yeah. He, <laughs> he's got things he wants to do with his life. But the, uh, the brothers... The brothers speak up, and they have the last word. And again, the ambiguous wording. Uh, This is uh, verse 31. They said, but they answered. And the thing is, the word there really isn't answered in Hebrew. It's more that they just said. uh, 
should our sister be treated like a prostitute? Yeah. That's... Yeah. And so uh, and so they say this. And the thing is, we don't know if they're saying this to Jacob. They're saying this behind Jacob's back. Um, but in reality, kind of the question uh, that could, that they're asking here is, would you treat Rachel's daughter this way? Right. Because this is the setup. Because the next story we go into, there's a couple of smaller episodes, little com- things that go on. But then the next story we're going to go into is Joseph. Right. A- and, and note the contrast when, you, when Jacob finds out Joseph is dead, supposedly. He loses his mind. Right. Now, um, before we go too much farther, one thing I want to ad- address, and I think this is interesting, is they say th- they've committed an outrage in Israel. Mm-hmm. We're, do, do you have anything on that? Because we're, we're in Genesis. Yeah. And, and the thing is, there's no nation of Israel at this point. Right. And Jacob's name hasn't even been changed. Well, it was changed privately. Oh, was it? Was it, it? Okay. With, the, with the wrestling. Oh, okay. I, 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 mm-hmm. That's right. It was. But there's another section where it's there's like a public... official mm-hmm. uh, changing of his name. Yeah. And so I find that really interesting that you have this kind of anachronistic naming of the place here which is this it it, is this one is it is it editorial do we think it was it was possibly changed later to the name or possible or do we think possibly if if we're assuming mosaic authorship if we assume that moses wrote it Mm -hmm. um is it is it moses kind of like breaking the fourth wall as the narrator (laughs) (laughs) like like, so, sorry, I didn't mean to make you yeah, choke on your out. coffee. Uh, uh, but it, was it kind of like, hey, now, th- this is what happened. Don't do this thing. <laughs> you know, so uh, you, not in your own yard. Right. Well, and, and that that really is a good question because. Um, or, or saying that this isn't the type of behavior that's acceptable in our na- in our land. Right. Because it can either be a declaration of faith on behalf of the sons saying, you know, this is Israel. This is the land that we're going to inhabit and we're going to flourish here. Sure. So there's that aspect there or it could be any of the things you mentioned. And um, but. However, it's said it, it is highly significant. And so. Um, I want to point out, I want to tell you why, and the, the, there's two things I want to point out, just because if I don't, excuse me, I'll get lost in, um, in, in the significance. Well, that's, yeah, that was one of the things that jumped out to me, so I wanted, I wanted mm-hmm. to get to that before we move, Definitely. move too far. No, it's, a, it's an important point, and, and actually a lot's built on that. So we have this, you know, should our sister be treated like a whore or a prostitute, depending on the translation? Um, like I said, I think the real question there is, is would you have treated Rachel's daughter this way? Um, but in giving Simon and Levy this last word in, in the chapter here on this account, uh, some have said that this is definitely, Sternberg is one of them, a definitely approving of what they've done. Uh, I don't think it's that clear. Right. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a really odd story. Mm-hmm. And there's, there's very little concrete I mean, I the, I mean, I know the reason you don't teach this in in Sunday school is because it's hard to pull a concrete moral out of it. Well, I, I think I think though it, it's it's the setup, and you know, you and I were talking about this some um, yesterday. Joseph is presented kind of as the golden boy, right? And so many, uh, so many of the um, the accounts. I mean, oh yeah, he was a little arrogant, but you know, he was young, and and then. You know, he makes that great declaration that um, basically what you meant for evil, God meant for good. See the strength of his faith. And, and if you go back and you, I mean, this is really going to be on display as we go through. Mm-hmm. Joseph was a brat. And I, I mean, I just found myself as I was studying him, just wanting to smack him so many times. Um, so, but that setup, that contrast uh, that Jacob really loves Rachel. And I think at some point he, he really does accept Leah and it's really interesting. He, he doesn't get buried with Rachel. Uh, he gets buried with Leah and it's kind of the statement that the Torah is, is saying Leah is his true wife. Mm-hmm. And so that's kind of symbolic of that. And so in this, whenever we have the, you know, the last word, the last word's always important. I mean, ask any married couple. 
Mm -hmm. Uh, The the last word kind of sums up. But uh, how important is it? And the other thing I think we need to point out too, this is the first time that we have a sister, an actual legit full sister who has been sexually assaulted that the brother defends. Right. Because we have Abraham with his half sister, who in all reality is his wife. And he doesn't protect her. Right. We have right. Yeah. Yeah, Isaac with Rebecca. And so we're starting to see a shift in family dynamics. And, um, you know, so if we see this as a favorable, favorable account as far as Simon and Levy, then um, this is good. They're starting to value the family relationships. They're starting to, to put emphasis on protecting not just um, – themselves but actually the defenseless woman in the equation right so this is this is very good but i don't think the torah actually gives us a a full-on here's the hero of the moment right i i think it really leaves it it really puts the family's dysfunction on display oh yeah yeah there's yeah because that's i don't know that's just to me that's so weird like just the whole the whole setup, and then then you go into the, like their strategy of how they're going to take care of it. Mm-hmm. I mean, very tricky. Yeah, and well, it just was it just blows my mind the whole story, even trying to, to wrap my head around it. Well, and, and it, it's so weird that actually uh, a lot of people who are into the documentary hypothesis, which is the idea that basically there was all these ver- stories floating around, some were written by a priestly writer or one mm-hmm. was written by uh you know whatever all these different stories and then somebody basically gathered them all up and edited them together and so you don't have a single author um they they said that this story was actually inserted some of the, and now i do not agree with this but when jacob blesses his sons i think it's chapter 48 he he's pretty down on simon and levy and he talks about how in their anger they killed men and so one of the theories that's out there with people who support the, this documentary theory is was they had to explain that, that two-verse blessing, and they do this by adding an entire chapter to the Bible. Now, I would think that the easier thing to do would remove the two verses, but evidently, you know, the great conspiracy that it is to uh, make the Bible seem important that people seem to think is out there um it's no we, we're just going to add an entire chapter right a- and I, I don't and i think we can kind of forget that idea when we do see how it, it becomes the, the foundation for so much um dina this is the last we hear of her she she just kind of fades from the text um her brothers go and get her who knows if she married again who knows what happened with any of that but the question you ask yep finally got to answer it so um not time yeah well you know i'm kidding i'm kidding there's there's a lot of good information (laughs) um second samuel 13 we have the story um it's about david's children uh tamar uh who is his daughter and if you know anything about your bible anytime you hear the name tamar uh that should raise some some red flags for you Tamar and Amnon, and it is connected specifically by that this ought not be done in Israel, that this this outrage shouldn't happen in Israel. Right. Because one of the, the really interesting contrast, okay, well, we've got the similarities. We have a brother and sister. Um, they're the main players. Uh, we have a rape scene. Uh, and the thing is, where Dina never speaks, Tamar actually speaks. And Tamar, uh, she, man, she just kind of rips at you if you read her story and right. think about what she's going through. Um, she is a virgin, so she doesn't leave, like we said before. So David sends her to Amnon. Now, Amnon says, you know, hey, I'm so sick. Send my sister to me. I'll eat from her hand. I'll feel better. And he asked David this, and David sends... Tamar to him. And, and here's the first problem. Uh, Tamar does not go out. She's sent. Mm-hmm. So there, there's a contrast there. So Tamar's the more virtuous of the two, according to a lot of commentators. Again, who knows? Sure. 
Um, the Bible specifically says that he is in love with her. And um, once he's alone with her, of course, you know, he, he does his foul deed. And we know that his, his love turns to hate. And the way he talks to her, because uh, she, she actually pleaded with him. And that's where she says, you know, such a thing not to be done. You, if you do this, you're going to be no th- more than the scum of the earth. Where am I going to carry my shame? Um, she, she pleads with him and he totally ignores her and he, and after the deed is done, he hates her. So now I, uh, I think this might be where you're going. Are you Mm -hmm. speculating that it's possible Shechem had not done anything forcefully because he doesn't despise her afterwards? That seems to be what the writer of Samuel is setting up. Samuel? Uh huh. Because in, the writer Samuel oh, with, gotcha. okay. with, yep. okay. with Amnon Sorry. and Tamar, and he he is really seeming to point out that Shechem wasn't such a bad dude. Because if you look at Amnon, there's nothing redeeming about him. Sure. He, I mean, he he's horrible. And the thing was, Amnon was next in line to inherit. Right. He should have been the successor to to David. Um. And so after this, when he kicks her out, matter of fact, he kicks her out and locks the door. Now we're right back to the story in Judges where the, what the hell, man. man, yeah, the Levite, they put the, the concubine out, they lock the door. Mm-hmm. And, and so this is how bad Amnon is. He, he's the, the Levite who doesn't care. He's the rapist of the city. He's a horrible person. Shechem may not be such a bad guy. Okay. And so, you know, there, because again, it could have been, this was not a rape against Dina. It was the fact he didn't respect the family. And so that's the question that we have to ask. Now, in the story, uh, when we compare them, you know, of course, Jacob and David being the fathers, Mm -hmm. they they play off each other. Amnon is Shechem. Uh, Absalom steps in as Simon and Levi both. Now, Absalom is like one of those characters in the Bible that just, he fascinates me. I, I, he, cause he does everything that Simon and Levy didn't do. He waits, he waits two years. He, he takes um, Tamar back to his home. He cares for her. He tells her, you know, be quiet. We're just, we're going to handle this. In two years, he goes to David says, Hey, I'm throwing this huge party. Dad, I'd like for you to come. And, We'd just love for you to be there. David says, no, son, it's going to be too big of a, a, a hassle. I'm going to bring servants. It's going to be too much out of your pocket to host us all. Not going to do it. And um, he says, well, if you can't come, send Amnon. And then once Amnon gets there, Absalom has him killed. But the whole thing, he gave David two years to speak up, to do something. Mm-hmm. Just like Jacob, David stayed silent. He never right. once speaks about. And matter of fact, the writer Samuel is also saying David's worse than Jacob because Jacob, David sent her there. Right. Jacob, yeah, he's silent and we can hold this against him. And we realize that this is a failing because think about it. If Jacob at any point had spoke up and said, boys, this is what we're going to do. This is how we're going to handle it. He probably could have reigned Simon and Levy in. Sure. But, but he doesn't. But David, he can't speak. Because right before all this happens with uh, Amnon and Tamar, he's had the whole fiasco with Bathsheba. Right. And so, um, the, but the thing is, Amnon even has political intentions. So we got that tie-in. Because Tamar is Absalom's ha- uh, sister, full sister. He's, she's Amnon, Tamar is Amnon's half-sister. And by taking Tamar as a wife, he's even more fully solidifying his position as the next in line for the crown. Okay. And so when it never should have been, I mean, it, he, he's a horrible person. Absalom was absolutely the one who, who had the character to stand up and say, this is right. This is just, this is what needs to happen. Now, Am- Absalom's got his problems. We know that later in, in what goes down. But the other real que- interesting question, which kind of doesn't have anything to do with their story, but it kind of does. Yeah, I guess it does. If David had agreed to go, would Absalom have killed David? 
Because if we're playing off the same story, Simon and Levy are furious with Jacob. Is our dad going to let her be treated like a whore? Right. So. Well, I mean, I, or was, the, was, was it like, or would it have been maybe, uh, maybe the, the last uh, attempt? You know, we're going to have dad here. We're going to you know, sit down, have some drinks, and then we're going to talk about this. But when, when David didn't send, or when David didn't come and, and sent uh, Amnon in his place, then Absalom's like, uh, well, okay, well, that didn't work out. I tried. That was, I mean, been working on this for two years now and couldn't get a meeting. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. And, and so now we're just going to, we're going to stand up and take matters into our own hands, which, which is exactly what Simon and Levy did. And, um, and just like Simon and Levy plundered the city, Absalom's going to begin to try to plunder the, the kingdom. Sure. And he even goes on and he sleeps with uh, David's concubines, I believe. And mm. so that, that's horrible. But the, the stories ultimately aren't about the women. They aren't even about the rapist. They're about the fathers. And how are the fathers handling the situation? Now, Jacob had every moral right to speak up. He could have spoken up. David had totally removed any moral footing he had ever had. Right. And so it, it becomes a story of succession because, you know, Jacob has been told you kings are going to proceed from you. Right. And you can't trust men like Simon and Levy to, to run the kingdom. And they're, they're too hot-headed. They're, they're going to cause problems. And the thing is, this is a, in a contrast with Judah, who we, I think we all know that Judah becomes the one that the kings actually ultimately come through. And uh, the ones who, the, the tribe that gives us the Messiah. Right, and and he wasn't perfect either. But we're we're gonna talk about that soon. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and so, I just I, I love the story because it it gets uh, there. There's there's so much there that, like I said, Esther picks it up. We see it in in this conquering of Jericho. We see it in this story. Uh, we see it again. It's going to show up in Joseph's story. Uh, Potiphar's wife. Mm-hmm. It, I, all of these themes, and it all begins right here. And this, we overlook it. Right. So that's, and that's kind of what all I've got with that. Uh, I wish we knew more. I, I wish that we, the, the text wasn't so ambiguous, but in some ways, but I think it also wouldn't have been as fluid. Yeah. And, and so, I mean, so we, we definitely cracked open a whole bunch of questions on here. And I know that there's probably nothing but questions uh, when you really get into this text. But, uh, well, let's uh, let's try to link to some of the sources that you found, if any of them were public, so people can kind of see like a, a little more of the questions and, and let them give some time to to ponder them on their own. Yeah, because I mean, I really sometimes when I get to doing the, the this research, uh, I spend more time deciding what not to tell y'all yeah. than what yeah. to <laughs> tell you. And, and I do want to bring out that that there is um, there is controversy. And when there's controversy in a scripture, I don't just want to blow by it and go, oh, well, this is the right interpretation, and this is what you need to believe about it. Uh, It goes back to a previous episode where we talked about wrestling with scripture. I think we need to acknowledge that, hey, the text is ambiguous. Mm -hmm. Um, Matter of fact, one thing I forgot about, where Simon and Levy are saying that uh, at the very end, you know, the, the ambiguous nature there, are they saying this to Jacob? Shall our sister be treated as a whore? Are they saying it behind his back? If they're saying it behind his back, then there's a possibility when we get to Joseph and Joseph is re- returning and giving his father evil reports about his brothers. Right. That this could actually be a reference to that. Okay. But again, that ambiguity in the text that really, in order to, to immerse ourselves, we do have to wrestle with it. So. Yeah. Cool. Do you have anything else on that or is that? No, I, I think. That's all we got for the show. I think, uh, yeah, let's leave it there. Okay, and then yeah, we'll... right, that's that's that seems like a good place to leave it at the end of the story, and then we'll, I guess, next week. What do we? Uh, Joseph, is that where we're starting? Uh, uh, no, not quite. Not quite, actually, because I dove down another rabbit hole, and. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so... But we we've got to talk about uh, the death of Rachel, 
And oh, yeah, the death of Rachel and Isaac and mm-hmm. all that. So and yeah, so yeah, got a lot going on. I, I, I for some reason I completely I, I read through this yesterday. I can't remember why I forgot. There's so much here. Yeah, so that's exciting stuff to look forward to. That's what we'll be doing next week. Thank you for joining us. We hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, uh, hit like, subscribe. If you've already done those things, leave a comment. Let us know what you thought. If you have any questions, let us know. And uh, if you really, really liked it, head over to patreon.com slash ravencreeksc. And become a member of the Paddle Store. Become a member of the Paddle Store. And we will be glad to, to have you in there and, and join the discussion. So, um, again, thank you so much. Uh, we'll be looking forward to next week. And until then, have a great time. Thanks. Bye. You've been listening to the Faith and Other Oddities podcast, a Raven Creek Social Club production. Don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. If you like what you've heard, please write us a review on iTunes or consider supporting us on patreon.com slash ravencreeksc. As always, thank you for listening and don't forget to join us next week.